right now, and I'm going to repeat what I just said. Um, my apologies. This is the July 20th, 2021 uh, meeting of the Transportation and Parking Commission. My name is Donna Lascalia, and I am the chair. Um, so um, again, this meeting is audio and video recorded, and I will ask Beth to take the role, please. Donna, you are here. I can see. Donna, are you here? Yes. Jody is not visible. Jody, are on, you hiding? Jody's on vacation. Okay. Um, Jamie? Yes. Wayne is still not here, correct? I don't see him. Nancy? Not here. No, Aaron? Nancy's here. Aaron? Jim? I am present. Adam? Don't see Adam. And Diana, welcome. I'm here, thank you. Okay, so that's six and uh, we do have a quorum. Um, so we can uh, continue with the meeting. Um, I'd like to invite um, any member of the public who's here who wishes to speak as part of public comment to do so now um, in the event that you are here for a particular uh, agenda item. Um, we have Main Street, traffic calming on North Street, High Street, and an ordinance for Armory Street. Um, you are uh, also welcome to uh, hold those comments until those uh, agenda items actually come up. So is there any member of the public who'd like to speak uh, on any topic uh, to the commission? You can raise your uh, virtual hand and we will recognize you if that's the case. Okay, I don't see any hands and I just wanna make sure I'm not missing anybody. Um, okay, hearing none, we will move on to approval of the minutes from the prior meeting, which was May 18th, 2021. May I have a motion for a positive recommendation, please? A motion for a positive recommendation of the, of the meeting notes, minutes, excuse me. I'll second. Is there any discussion about the minutes? Okay, hearing none. Beth, please call the roll. Anna? Yes. J uh, Jamie? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Diana? Yes. Okay, passes. passes. Yes. Thank you, Beth. Okay, next is reports from departments and subcommittees. Um, I will uh, start by uh, just saying a few words about uh, DPW projects that are ongoing. It's a busy summer construction season. We replaced the water main on Atwood Drive and paved. The project is substantially complete. We're also working on the sewer line in the Masonic Street parking lot and on Amber Lane. Um, we are remedying a failing sewer line, which passes through both the Masonic Street parking lot and Air in Berlin. Um, the sewer line serves multiple Main Street businesses and residents. The project also upgrades the water main to allow for enhanced fire flows and future sprinkler con connections. Um, the construction has begun and will be ongoing throughout the summer months. The lot is closed. Uh, Eversource is uh, working there now to relocate a gas main. Um, it's also a project in the Roundhouse parking lot um, for the rehabilitation and expansion of the Roundhouse lot. That project's being managed by Central Services. Um, the DPW will be paving multiple city streets this summer, uh, among them Pine Street, Warfield Place, Hayes Avenue, Meadow Street, and Loudville Road. Project includes pavement reclamation, drainage work, bridge repairs, intersection reconfiguration um, that was actually ex uh, discussed uh, extensively at, at this commission, uh, Pine, Maple, and Man Terrace. Pavement marking, sidewalk, and curb ramp improvements and curb work. And curb work. Project has begun. Contractor mobilized within the city limits. Um, last week. Um, North Farms Road is also substantially complete. Um, we uh, paved this road last year, about two miles 
um, from Arcanum Field to the city limits uh, with Williamsburg and punch list items are ongoing right now. There are also mass DOT projects, um, the King Street corridor, and also on Damon Road, uh, questions about those projects should be referred to mass DOT district two. Um, are there uh, anyone else who has any updates for uh, the, com the commission? Um, I'm, I'm not sure, I still don't see Wayne, but uh, any other commissioners who have any updates for us? Okay, seeing none, um, next we'll move to matters before the commission. So 5A, Main Street for Everyone Steering Committee. Um, there's a presentation on parking, transportation, and snow removal for Main Street, and Ben Wheel is here with us. Um, so, Ben, whenever you are ready, uh, you are welcome to take it away. Yeah, give me one second to share my screen here. Um, and um, so, so uh, my name is Ben Weil, um, and I am one of about 40 active members of this kind of new group that that formed in response to the Main Street redesign um, and called we're calling ourselves Main Street for everyone and a, a few of our number are here uh, uh, virtually um, and so we had a, have a lot of expertise in our group having to do with urban design and uh, sustainability and, and those sorts of topics. Um, I am a professor of building science at UMass and I work kind of extensively with the city. I'm also on the uh, Northampton Energy and Sustainability Commission. So I've kind of been involved with the city government. Um, and I will say that um, what I'm gonna discuss has to do with Main Street and I certainly have a point of view on, um, on the, the Main Street redesign, but the subject of parking management and snow removal actually go a little bit farther than that. And so, that, so I just wanna make that clear. So when we look at the, the to-do and you've seen the uh, letters to the editor in the, in the Gazette and you know that there is, there is some level of conflict over what, what is the final design for, uh, for Main Street redesign. And we know that the city has more or less settled on alternative three. <clears throat> and I'm gonna be open that I hope that they will still be open to modifying it. And the modification is not terribly large. So the main conflict really comes down to parking. And it comes down to this retention of angled parking, uh, which for a number of reasons is, we don't believe is a good choice. And we think that parallel parking is a better choice. And the primary reason of course, is that it devotes more space. It, well, if angled parking devotes more space to cars on the street and, um, and our proposal to have only parallel parking on Main Street, adds much more space for people and for trees. And so uh, because the city was not willing to ask Tool, the uh, consultant to mock up a design that incorporated our ideas, I took Tool's uh, mock up or their, their map and made a modification. That, so that's what you see, see here in, in, the, in this modification. You can see a lot more trees. You can see the parallel parking kind of designated in there and you can see more space uh, for people. So this is what the conflict is about. And I do hope that the, that the city will consider adjusting this particular decision. But as I said, there will be a reduction in parking on Main Street regardless. So the, uh, the subject that I'm next going to talk about, which is parking management, is something that is going to be need, you're going to need to deal with it regardless of what happens. And so that's why I think the sooner we get on this particular part, uh, the better it is and the less conflict we have over this question of parking. So first of all, let's remember that the reason that we are getting the grant from MassDOT Mass to do this uh, redesign project is because of the safety record of Main Street. So I went to MassDOT's data and I excluded all of the, the incidents, the, all, all of the crashes that had to do with intersections or had to do with 
tall vehicles hitting the, the railroad bridge. And, um, and I looked at the parts of Main Street where we have angled parking and the parts of Main Street where we had parallel parking and I normalized for street length and vehicles per day. And what you can see is that we have more crashes. It's about 37% more dangerous where you have parallel parking. And this is roughly in line with the research from other communities. Um, and you'll notice that most of the communities are out west because this business of angled parking really doesn't fit with a New England history and, and architecture and vernacular at all. But where you see these, these larger studies done out west, you see a similar uh, ratio of accidents between angle and parallel parking. So if we care about safety, that's a reason to, to do away with angled parking uh, once and for all. But regardless of what we end up doing, we are going to have conflict over parking and we are going to have the same people who are upset about the concept of removing angled parking will be upset about the removal of any parking spaces. And um, so we, we need to really think about how do we manage parking? And so the, the challenges come down to two that I see are two. One is we have fears. We have a fears about parking capacity reduction. And then we have this avoidance, which we've kind of kicked the can down the road and said, we'll solve this snow removal thing later, right? And we better not do that, I think. Um, so the answers to those problems are that we need preemptive policy change. We can start parking management now and get people used to whatever reduction of, of parking there is on Main Street, whether it's the amount of parking reduction I want or the amount of parking reduction that will just happen due to compliance with all, all these other um, limitations of the space. Um, and then with regard to the snow removal, this is our opportunity to design so that we can reduce the pro problem. And I'm gonna introduce kind of two ways of thinking about that. So first of all, with regard to parking capacity and fears, we have plenty of parking. So uh, I got the data for the occupancy of the garage pre-pandemic. And I took the average at, uh, of different times of day, of different times of the week. And there is no time when it's really more than three quarters full on average. That doesn't mean that there aren't times when the, 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 the space is at capacity, but it's kind of insane to design for this 1% or 2% of the year and then make this large investment when you can do other adaptations. And I'll get into what some of those can be. But for 87% of the year, there are more empty spaces in this one parking garage than all the possible on-street spa spaces on Main Street. So if you imagine that the, all of those spe spaces were empty, you still have more, um, uh, more space in the parking garage for most of the year. A switch uh, to parallel parking only loses less than 2% of total downtown parking of all the spots. So the issue is not that we don't have enough spots. The issue is getting people into them and getting the turnover to happen right. And that's the problem is that people don't know where it is and they're not incentivized to use it. And there are a bunch of reasons for that. One is that there are perverse price signals. So 25 cent difference is simply too small to impact behavior. Um, and in fact, that first hour free in the parking garage actually creates, uh, and this is, this is kind of well-established in, in um, behavioral economics, it actually creates higher turnover because now you think of that first hour as free, but once that hour ticks down, you need to leave. And we actually see that in the data where you actually have periods of time when it's clear that there's, there's more turnover. People are spending less than an hour in the, uh, in the garage. Whereas once you occupy a relatively inexpensive and very, very high value space on the street, you're gonna hoard it. And you're gonna stay there as long as you can. You're gonna walk around and do every business that you can in town because, uh, it, because you've finally got that space that, that's hard to get. And when it's free and you can basically, it's not enforced. So after six o'clock, people are gonna stay there all night. So we could improve pricing, but if people don't know the differences in prices and they don't know where the parking is, then they're not gonna go there. And so we have 
uh, and congratulations to the city for installing these smart signs. They tell us how many spots are in the EJ Gare parking garage. But to those coming from out of town and surprisingly, a whole lot of our neighbors, a whole lot of people living in Northampton don't know about the parking garage. It's, it's always shocking to me when I discuss this with people, how many or lived here eight years and only discovered it in year eight. You know, So having signs that actually direct you to the parking garage and the other, uh, other places to park in downtown would be really helpful. Then you need a comparison. You need to know, well, but are there a bunch of empty spots on Main Street? And the answer is almost always gonna be no. And that will help you decide quickly, oh, I think I'll go to that parking garage and look, there's a sign that's gonna tell me, here's the number of spaces and here's how to get to this off, off street parking site. And it's gonna be this much cheaper than, uh, than parking on the street. So that's the type of information you need to have a market effect. So I am not the first person to come up with these ideas, not by a long shot. Um, and so back in 2015, uh, there was a pretty decent parking management study done. And I've looked at, sorry, at the relevant um, the, the recommendations from the, from the study. And uh, we were supposed to, by now, have increased it to a buck 50, the, the price on Main Street, and it's at a dollar. So we're about a quarter, uh, sorry, a third of the way there, um, but we're behind. Um, they say we should change the enforcement of Main Street from 8 p.m. Uh, and delay meter start times. In other words, there's no demand for, for parking at 7 a.m., so there's no reason to enforce it and there's no reason to charge for it. Uh, but we haven't changed, we haven't uh, implemented the recommendations from this parking management study that we paid for. Um, this is a really important one. Retain a signage and graphics consultant to improve wayfinding. They found the same thing that I found as a resident, which is that people don't know where the parking is and, and, they, and they don't know how to get, get to it. And of course, they at that time in 2015 recommended pay by plate meters, but we have a parking app. So we have it, but we're not really using it as much as we could. So we have this potential to use it. And then, then they also recommended to phase out the free hour in the garage. So basically, um, we could do well simply by uh, working with them. So here's the question is, what is the right price for street uh, for on-street parking? And uh, so when I look for this, what I want to know is what is the price elasticity of parking? In other words, what is the change in the price that would cause people to make a different choice about parking? And when we think about that, we've got two different categories to think about. We need to know is a mode change possible? And if we have only one mode, so if we can't switch to riding a bike or getting on a bus or whatever it is, we're only gonna be coming in by car, then we know that we're, we're still gonna to have to look at this comparison between the price for a parking spot, say on the street and the price for a parking spot somewhere else. Um, and, uh, and then of course there's, there, there's no mode shift in parking. So what we have is a situation where most people are coming in in cars, we would like to push them towards switching modes, right? That's, that's a general sustainability policy of the city. But th so this, uh, I took a meta-analysis and what I like about meta-analysis is this looks at about 50 studies and they build a uh, regression to try and find, well, what do all these studies say in common? And the basic answer is the elasticity of parking occupancy is about negative 0.3. So what that means is, is that we need a 1% change in on, to create a 1% change in on-street demand, we need to increase the price difference by about three times. So at peak parking, we need roughly a 10% change to assure that we have about 80% of the on-street spaces uh, um, occupied, but no more than 80%. So if we were to take the current price difference, which is 25 cents and multiply it by three, and then we want to get this 10% change, we would require a $7.50 per hour parking, which I think would probably cause some upset, <laughs> right? People would probably not like that here. 
but we have other levers. We can lower the parking garage fee. Remember, right now it's free for that first hour. But if we get rid of the free first hour, we can start to adjust that price. So the parking garage could go down to 10 cents. And that means that on-street parking could, could raise to, you know, to $3 during the lower demand period. And, and then, and then in, or sorry, during the, the peak demand period, but it could also go back down when it's, when it's not as critical. And we only need a 1% change. We just need a few people to decide for the garage instead of the, the, the main street. We can do, as, do well on a 75% difference. So the garage could go up to 50 cents, which remember right now we're charging nothing. So I think this probably ends up being a money maker for the city while causing more people to find parking faster. Um, and then uh, it, you know, it ramps up and down relative to the peak. And you could do this dynamically, but you could also simply post new hours and you could say, well, here's what the price is gonna be. And then it, and then it changes, but we have this parking app. We have the dynamic signage. We could have good you know, additions to that, those dynamic signage. And that way we could really use prices to manage our parking. So, once we have some ability to push people towards where we want them to park, the, all those unused um, uh, off street parking spots, we should really think about it with this main street redesign, what are the priority functions for on street parking? And I think this, they should be the following, more compl uh, accessibility compliant, parking spots. So we, that's been a major source of conflict and something that the city could do a lot better with. So make sure there's more spots where you can get to easily. Short-term parking. So we want rapid turnover. And in fact, the merchants benefit from rapid turnover. So if you had more short-term parking spots so that customers could pick up larger items from merchants or they can get takeout, that benefits the, the merchants and the customers. And then the other thing is, again, this is from our group talking to a lot of Main Street businesses, is that there's loading and unloading zones, and we can use time of day prioritization to manage that. But an even bigger problem is this sense of you have an emergency. Let's say you're a restaurant and your, uh, your, your oven is out, and you need a, a commercial service contractor to come in right away and as an emergency and fix that uh, broken piece of equipment. Well, if there's someone parking for, on, at, for two hours in front of your spot and you can't get your, your uh, uh, commercial service vehicle in there, they're going to be upset or they're going to park and they're going to stay for longer and they're going to get a ticket and the merchants understand that they are just going to have to pay that ticket, that that's the price of having someone come in and fix your oven. It turns out the city has a meter bag rental process where you can actually, you know, reserve a spot, but it's cumbersome and unknown to many businesses. So streamlining that and making that reservable would be a great way to serve those businesses well, give them a lot more value for the, uh, the parking spots that are in front of their businesses and maybe make them less resistant. Although we're finding that there, aren't, there isn't that much resistant actually from businesses downtown to a reduction of on-street parking in Main Street. So those are what I think are priority functions. So these recommendations, again, just for this one portion is that we wanna increase ADA spots, reserve commercial service vehicle parking, dynamic pricing enforced from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. So enforce it when it's actually in demand, dynamic signage, which is necessary to make dynamic pricing actually work, right? You only, markets need information and price signals, and then integration with the parking app and pay by plate and other sorts of things that we should be investing in now so that we can, uh, that we can implement them after, you know, before the Main Street redesign. And so everyone is comfortable with them when that happens and you don't get a lot of blowback once we've gotten that thing. That said, we should advocate for elimination of angle parking on Main Street because we now, if we implement these other ideas, we have plenty of ways to get people to parking that they need, get people into downtown, and therefore we don't need the extra spaces that those angle parkings might would provide. So this is another insight about angled parking. 
So the top image is, is a, a Google Earth uh, image of Main Street um, over, over here. And the bottom image is a uh, clip art of, uh, of a parking lot. What we have is a parking lot. And that's why we manage snow the way that owners of parking lots manage snow, which is, which is already not great. But once you reduce the number of lanes and that center lane is really for turning and for emergency vehicles, I'm not so sure that we should be storing snow down the middle of our city street once, again, once we've done this redesign. And so we really need to think about how are we going to deal with the snow and invest in it now. So here's another reason why angled parking impacts this, this decision. So angled parking takes up more space. It requires a wider drive, drive lane because you need more uh, parking and unparking space. It's just this is what I learned from Tool, the, the consultant who's working on this project for us. And parallel parking requires, you know, it's a, it's a standard uh, urban feature. So what you see is a 20 foot difference in the cross section between these two choices. And this is a choice being made now, right? By December, we get our 25% design that determines where those curbs are. And basically we need to plow as four cars the space between the curbs. So that's a 20 foot cross section. So let's imagine a one foot snow event. So for every one foot of street length, angled parking adds 20 cubic feet of snow. Uh, the section currently planned for angled parking is 586 feet. I love doing math on, on, on Zoom. Uh, so multiply by, that by 20, that's uh, almost 12,000 cubic feet of additional snow. That needs that's additional snow that needs to be removed compared to if we just had parallel parking. Now Donna can correct me on this because I'm making these these guesstimates. I think a DPW truck has a capacity of about 420 cubic feet, which would mean if you wanted to remove all of that additional snow and had to get it away from the site, that's 28 additional trips. If I'm wrong, I'm glad to to, to get more accurate data on this, but um, but it's somewhere in that ballpark anyway. Um, Donna? Hey, yeah, th thanks, Ben. And, and um, I, I certainly can't exactly corroborate those numbers. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, when we haul snow, um, the level of effort is far in excess of, of 28 dump trucks. So it's a- This is a, just the difference. It, yeah, I mean, it's a it's a massive mobilization, and, and I have no reason to doubt your numbers, um, though we, we can certainly refine them, um, and, and I can speak a little bit more about that, um, you, you know, when you're done with your presentation. Yeah, I appreciate that. So, but, but the point then carries that at least when this decision to go with angled versus parallel parking imposes essentially forever a big additional cost and challenge for removing snow. And what we can expect is larger snow events followed by, uh, you know, a freeze thaw events, followed by melting, followed by freezing, which contributes, of course, to um, potholes. So the better we control this snow now, the better off we are. And so we can plan for this. So first of all, hey, didn't we just change what we're doing with the space and, and don't we have to get rid of the snow on the uh, sidewalks and bike lanes? Well, the first thing to say is that there is no difference in the amount of sidewalk you have to clear and the amount of bike lane you have to clear between angled and uh, parallel parking. That's, that remains the same. So we're not looking at a difference. On the other hand, we should think about this because that's still snow that somebody has to move from where it is to somewhere else. And if we're not gonna store it in the middle of the street, which I think we shouldn't, that this is still a problem to, to think about. And I think that we should consider snow melt. And the reason for that is that sidewalk and bike lanes are suitable. They're, they're not gonna be, you're not gonna have a, a, a big heavy truck riding on them. So they're suitable for concrete or permeable paving. Permeable paving actually will benefit the trees that we're hoping to add to Main Street and do a good subsoil conditions. The basic concept of snow melt, and I can certainly go into this more in, in detail if someone wants, is that we you have hydronic tubes that circulate a, a heated 
glycol water mix to raise the temperature of the surface only when it's below freezing and there's, and there's liquid falling. Um, it has generally a lower cost of ownership, although it's, it's expensive to install. The typical ROI is 0.12. So that means you're thinking about a, a simple payback of something like uh, eight years. Um, the heat source, unlike a DPW truck, which right now is gonna run on diesel, the heat source can be electrically driven heat pumps that can be powered by renewable energy and can also connect to any other storage me medium that we want, including taking rejected heat from say restaurants. It could be integrated into a larger district energy system, which is not something the city's considering right now, but I am hoping to encourage the city to consider this. So whether it was now or later, simply a glycol filled loop of, of water can be integrated into just about any system. Um, the big savings is actually reduced liability because you don't have to get a person with, a, with equipment out to make sure the, the sidewalk is cleared and salted. It will do it automatically. More importantly, or equally importantly, no salt, which means those new trees will actually probably survive. And we can even use it for heat extraction during the summer. Basically, you run the, the water and you dump heat into the ground or wherever you're, you're disposing of heat. And so as we get hotter and hotter summers, we can actually cool downtown using its sidewalks and, um, and, and bike lanes. So this is not a wild and crazy idea. The sidewalks in Anchorage, Alaska use snow melt. Uh, they're heavily used in Albany, New York and, and Toronto, uh, Canada. Um, they're typically used in places where, uh, um, actually, I guess this first picture here, you can see that's handicapped uh, zones um, in, uh, in, uh, uh, in Albany. Um, and so typically where you really, really don't want a slip and fall problem, that's, that's where people have invested. Um, so vehicle ramps. So it's fairly common and we could talk about it. Um, so these are the recommendations that, that, I'm, that I'm pushing, <laughs> which is uh, to eliminate angle parking based on safety and the annual savings associated with a number of things, but certainly associated with, with snow melt or with snow clearing. To include snow melt system for sidewalks and the cycle track in the main street design details. Um, and finally, to implement parking management, which means wayfinding, dynamic signage, dynamic pricing, and enforcement hours, uh, shifting them till later, and, and on the weekend, and doing that now, both to improve downtown and to get everyone used to a new, smarter regime. So that's, that's, my, uh, that's my story. Thanks so much for the presentation, Ben. I appreciate it. Um, and and I'll just um, jump in and speak very briefly about the logistics of um, snow removal, since that was part of uh, the you know part of your presentation. Um, and and I'll kind of start from the beginning. You know, it 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 starts snowing, and we have fifty eight plow routes that we run in the city, um, and that's all DPW employees. So we actually don't have outside contractors who plow for us, um, or or when we do, it's it's infrequent, um, and and they number less than five. Um, so these are all employees driving DPW trucks, and. Um, you know, to, to push snow on a wide thoroughfare like Main Street um, requires a, a level of effort that's far more significant than, than a residential neighborhood, certainly. Um, and we have to have weight in those trucks. Um, so, um, you know, we operate with uh, a grader, we operate with wing plows, um, and, and we have sanders um, that, are, that are actually in the back of our trucks. Um, so when we need to haul snow, when we need to remove snow, um, you know, or, or let me back up for a second, you know, our level of effort, anytime we have a storm, the 12 inch storm that you referenced as part of your presentation, you know, our number one priority is to clear the roadway so that everyone can travel on the roadway. And we have 160 miles of roadway in the city that we have to clear. So that's our number one priority. And then what we have to do is double back and say, okay, where is parking restricted? Um, and, and now how are we going to haul that snow? And that actually requires 
Um, you know, sometimes we can run 20, 24 hours just trying to clear the roadways. Then what we have to do is change over all of our equipment. So we have to take those dump trucks that have sanders in the back of them. We actually have to remove those sanders and change over it, remove and store those sanders so that we can actually put snow in the back of the dump truck and then haul it um, from wherever we're trying to haul it from. Um, you know, primarily the central business district um, and, and Florence and, and occasionally some smaller residential streets, depending on, on snowpack. Um, so the logistics and the level of effort associated with hauling snow are significant. And there is often a lead time um, on that, you know, depending on how bad the snowstorm is, um, there, there has to be a, a little recoup time um, for, the, for the staff to get to a place um, where they're able to, to operate. Um, and, and that operation is typically overnight. Um, so when we haul out of Main Street, many of you may know, you know, it, it, it's a it's a midnight start um, because we have to implement parking bans. So that's just a little bit of of you know, without really commentary on what we should do and how we should do it. Um, that that's actually the logistics of our snow removal operations, and and actually just the reality of the situation. Um, that we're faced with, with you know how we um, how we move snow around Northampton. So I just want to fill in that blank for for those who may not be um, aware of how we have to operate. Um, I will um, it at this point open it up to other commissioners um, who who have uh, questions or comments um, for for Ben on his presentation. Anyone um, anyone on the commission ha have any comments uh, for Ben? Okay, Nancy, I see your hand. Right. I, I would like to um, uh, clarify that we do use the Park Mobile app um, and that that is a very um, popular way to pay for parking. In fact, it is becoming, it's oh, more than half of the, um, the payments that are made are made through the Park Mobile app. Um, we also, um, did an extensive um, wayfinding review with a consultant and um, which resulted in more standardized signage um, and greater signage to point um, the public towards outside parking lots um, in an attempt to um, create greater turnover in um, the closer to the downtown business district so as to accommodate um, customers um, and uh, the merchants would have the greater turnover for their customers. Uh, I just wanted to clarify those two points. Thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Diana, did I see your hand? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, I had a question for Mr. Weil or perhaps the other commissioners. Um, with the alternative three plan that's been proposed, having a two way left turn in the middle of the street, um, the snow melt system it looks like it it really is just focused on the portion of the roadway that is just the bike lane and my question is is what is the understanding of where snow from the street itself is that going to be stored anywhere or you know i i wasn't sure what the bulk of of, of the snow issue was planned to be and how specifically your proposal would would affect things in relation to kind of the overall snow project versus just that bike lane piece. So, so I, I can respond to what what I intended to say and also what I don't know. Right. So what I don't know is what the city has decided. And my my impression is it's still being figured out of what do we do with all that snow that's in, in the middle of, of the road. I think there's some discussion that that center turn lane becomes temporary snow storage, which I could imagine being okay, but with one lane of travel, now your emergency vehicle movement is constrained. So I, so that's that's the part that I worry about. The reason that I, I, I would love to say, let's put snow melt over the entire street. And it's, it's conceivable and it is done. Uh, the challenge is that because it's a major route, heavy traffic goes on it. And generally speaking, you'll need repairable asphalt type uh, materials. And that's not terribly compatible with pipes running on underneath uh, the, the road. 
it's conceivable that that center lane, which they're already talking about being a slightly different material, that it could be a snowmelt patch. You could even set it up as basically a giant snowmelt. Uh, you know, you push the snow onto that patch and then it melts and that's how it goes away. Um, so that, that would be pretty energy intensive, um, but I'd need more information to be able to do the calculation of kind of energy and cost intensiveness versus uh, hauling it someplace like the old Honda lot or something. Um, it, so when I'm talking about snow melt, I'm thinking about basically uh, the, a, a stretch of pedestrian way, so a sidewalk, you know, so that, that is cleared for pedestrians and is safe. And then the bike path, which you'd want to be cleared. And then it, again, that's lower, uh, lower traffic uh, needed. You could also put it in the parking spaces because then again, you're, you're not usually putting high speed traffic with heavy, uh, uh, heavy trucks. So that's another place where you could, again, my, my vision is let's reduce the size of the problem so that then whatever problem we have to still solve is smaller. And that's solved by reducing the space taken up between those, those curbs. Thank you. Yeah, and, and I'll also just add, it, you know, when, when we plow major straightaways, so think King Street, we're plowing in tandem. So we're running two, two of the biggest trucks we have, the, you know, almost away if you watch how, like how Mass DOT plows the interstate, you know, so, so we're, we're running, we're running trucks staggered but simultaneous and and we are pushing the snow um, out of the street in a way that forces it to the sides of the roadway um, and and you know opening that main thoroughfare up um, and and when we double back to pick snow on main street you know it's a very um, sort of automatic operation everything's you know very straight line there's not a lot of um, pockets for snow to get lost in um, and and so things are a little bit easier for us or things are a lot of bit easier for us um, they, you know the the straighter lines that we have to work with um, the better so I, I mean one of the other considerations um, you know, on Main Street is, you know, the creation of, of pockets, um, it, you know, cr definitely creates a scenario where we cannot move snow in the way that I just described. Um, so it, it's more of a um, uh, sort of, you know, pardon the hand gestures here, but, um, you know, it, it's sort of a more zigzag operation that, that loses its efficiency and, and also loses a little bit more of snow load off to the side instead of just pushing it and, and you have a natural disbursement. So I, I just wanted to, to mention that while we're having the snow conversation. Um, any other, Councillor Nash, I see your hand. Thank you, Director. Um, so I have a, a you know, I, I appreciate the presentation and, and, and the ideas that are being expressed here. I, I, my, my question has to do with what we can do with this information and this discussion beyond having a discussion at the TPC. I, 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 I'm wondering if this information is going to tool or whether, um, I, I'm, I'm just confused about where this, how this information gets included in the, the design process, because it's my understanding that that the TPC doesn't weigh in, it hasn't been asked to weigh in on any of the alternatives or the proposals so far. And I, I don't anticipate that happening, uh, but, um, but maybe I'm wrong. Are we gonna have a vote on that? I, I'd like to know. <laughs> and maybe well, Wayne has the answer as well. I mean, I can certainly say what I would like <laughs> and, and, you know, and, and maybe that would be possible. So it seems to me that the TPC could choose to weigh in whether or not they've been asked. Um, and you, you could, uh, you know, t make that, uh, that opinion. And that mainly, I think, has to do with the location of the curbs, which is defined by the, this angle versus parallel parking decision. Um, so that's, that's one thing. 
And then the other part, and certainly as, as a city councilor, uh, this is an ordinance question. So it's true, as Nancy said, uh, we've uh, adopted um, uh, the Park Mobile. I use it, I like it, but the price is what the price is. So we've got the tool, but we're not using the price signal. And we have somewhat better signage, but without a price signal, there's no incentive to go uh, to go there. So if you combine the price signals, which could be the ones I recommend, or could be some, you know, some variation on those, but that basic concept of applying a price signal that's big enough to, to get, make, give people an incentive and the information to get there, right? So, so both parts have to be there. That's something that could be an ordinance. That's something that could be implemented right away. So they're really two, two separate things. Um, and yeah, I know that Wayne is here. Um, and I know that there's the, a general feeling that, uh, that it's a closed, that the discussion is closed, um, but I think that it is worth people raising their voices to open it back up again uh, with regard to angle versus parallel parking. Okay, um, Wayne, it, I see your hand up. You wanna hop in here? Sure, so let me just use it, it, the, the three points that, that Dan raised sort of to address each of those things. The first is, you know, because I think Making downtown vibrant is certainly an all of the above strategy. I agree with almost everything Ben said about the parking management. I think that's critical, but frankly, I think that's critical under any solution. I mean, you know, Ben said this and I don't disagree. There's not enough parking to serve all the merchants on Main Street. There never was, there never will be. And so parking management is critical. You know, as you know, yes, we have the smart signs. Yes, as Nancy said, we've invested in wayfinding, um, but there needs to be more as part of our downtown recovery. We've asked the team there to think about parking management. So I think, you know, no question that's needed. Snow removal is definitely not my area. So I really can't comment on that. But I can say, remember, Main Street is full of infrastructure gas, water, sewer, it needs more storm water. And so doing sort of an, you know, underground snowmelt stuff is it's probably the most complicated place in the entire city to do that in terms of complicated infrastructure. Doesn't mean it's not possible. I know it's a challenge. Again, not, not my area. Um, in terms of the overall design, I think we're still in a information gathering phase. Um, I think one of the key, so we're, you know, we're listening to a lot of different people out there. Um, I think one of the keys about the mayor saying we're going with angle parking is we still don't know how many parking spaces we're going to lose for things like truck loading and unloading areas that's not going to be in the center um, for areas where the distance between crosswalks is so short that angle parking may actually not give you any more parking than than parallel parking um, and almost certainly i absolutely certainly we're going to lose parking spots as we make it safer so um We've asked DPW to write an ordinance that will come before this committee, assuming I'm not putting pressure on Maggie, Maggie's the one doing all that, the heavy lifting, to write an ordinance, hopefully before you guys, to drop five parking spots that are the least safe parking spots downtown, where cars back up into crosswalks or block the view of crosswalks. And this is sort of, I think, our hope that we can have it all, right? We hear from merchants who want angle parking, we hear from people who are more comfortable doing angle parking than parallel parking. But then we hear from Ben and a lot of others, Ben is certainly not alone, that we want more space for other uses. Um, we may get space in different ways. And that's the part we're still assessing. And let's say, for example, each crosswalk, I, again, make this up, don't quote me on this, but just think about this out loud. If we need to make the crosswalk safe, it may well be that the crosswalk, the curb extensions for each crosswalk, are gonna be 25 or 30 feet wide. And that's gonna be room for sidewalk and street trees and outdoor dining on the curb extension, right? Because we, we don't want cars backing out to it. So until we know that, first, we don't know how many parking spots we're really losing. And second, we don't know if we can achieve the legitimate goals for Main Street for everyone in different ways. So I, I think the overall decision the mayor's made is we're sticking with angle parking but it's not gonna work everywhere. So there's gonna be more loss of angle parking. Some individual spots might have to be parallel for it to work. So 
I, I think we're just at the point of listening and doing that assessment call for you. Thanks, Wayne. Um, Jamie, I see your hand up. Um, yeah, hi, thank you. Ben, uh, thanks for your presentation and all the work that you and uh, Main Street for Everyone has done here. I appreciate your bringing that to us. Um, you mentioned that many business owners downtown uh, don't care for angled parking and would be fine with the parallel parking. Where does that information come from? And has anyone done a survey of that formally? Um, well, there are other people from our group who might be able to answer this better than I, um, but there's been a, a group of us who've basically gone to, I think probably all, mo certainly all of the first level and many of the upper level businesses. Um, and we have at this point, I think about 50 of them who have signed on to our uh, decision uh, or our design ideas, like on our website. So if you go to uh, Main Street uh, for everyone dot org, um, mm. Main ST for everyone, uh, they, they're they listed. So that's, that's the ones who are putting their name on the design uh, ideas that we have. Um, I know that there is another group um, that, um, thank you, Elena, um, and she put it in the chat. Uh, th there's, there's another group that is in favor of angled parking and um, generally it, not, not pleased with change, changes in general. They claim 60, uh, but those, those businesses have not put their names on anything. Um, so that's, that's the information I have. I know that there's a petition, but that is not just businesses, that's signers. Um, okay, so it sounds like more study should be done on that issue. If it yeah. Is a conversation. Thank you. Thanks, and, and I think at this point, it, it makes sense to um, open it up to others who may be in attendance who, um, who have a, a comment or a question. So um, um, I see, Alan, you've got your hand up. So let me unmute you, hold on just a second. Okay, go ahead, Alan. Hey Ben, I, I, or thank you so much for that presentation. It was it was really well done. I really appreciate it. For one of the central cases for snowmelt was liability, uh, and I just wondered where you got that two million dollar figure. Oh, I, honestly, that that was from a few articles where I was just looking looking up what you know what what had liability for 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 a slip and fall bin, and I averaged it. So, so, so I, <laughs> yeah. and not to, not not that this really changes your point at all because I, I think it was a compelling case no matter but Massachusetts liability for slip and fall is limited to five thousand dollars per incident under MGL. Oh. Um, so just so you know, as as you make that case going forward, it's I will five thousand bucks. All right, I will I will change that to to five thousand and. I hope somewhere in, in the record. Not that, not that, I mean, I, the humanity is the bigger deal there, right? We want Main Street safer. So, but I just saw that and thought I would help. No, you I really appreciate that. Right. Um, Thanks. It was really, really impressive presentation. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Alan. Um, Randy, I see that your hand is up. So hold on and we'll unmute you in a moment. Go ahead. Hi. Uh, I just wanted to thank. Uh, Ben for doing the presentation, it, it was terrific. Um, one thing I, I just wanted to note in the snow removal presentation with at the first order, just changing it as uh, option three changes, it reduces the snow, right? That reduces the volume of snow on Main Street. And I'm sure there'll be a, a lot of calculations about how much that is. So uh, that ought to make uh, the DPW life at least somewhat easier in terms of the fewer trips and reducing snow. And what Ben is talking about is an additional prudential reduction um, in snow as it goes along, um, both of which are, are good things, I think. So that's my comment. I, thank you. And I'm sorry, would you mind just your first and last name and your city or town of residence? Oh, uh, I'm sorry, Randy Saylor from Florence. Okay, thank you, Randy. Okay. Anyone else uh, with any comments for there are us? people who are waiting to comment. Okay, that's a that's a general comment though. Not I'm, I'd like to finish this. Uh, thank okay. you. I, I just want to make sure where where um, 
we've heard everyone who wishes to speak on, on Main Street. Um, I see a hand, uh, Kit. We're gonna unmute you here. Okay, my name's Kit Sangboos. I live in Northampton and I go downtown a lot. And I really think that angled parking is dangerous. And if we're talking about safety, then we shouldn't be having angle parking in part of the street and then not in other parts of the street, especially if the street is being narrowed, you know, angle parking would even be more dangerous. There'll be less space for cars to back out into. Every time I'm riding my bike downtown or I'm walking, um, I'm, I'm afraid that someone is going to back up into me. Um, also, there is, you know, if you just look around at towns, a busy street, you would never find angle parking on a real busy park, uh, city street. It's just sort of ridiculous. If you want to park angle parking, go to the garage, go to the parking lots. I really think that it's kind of a really privileged thing for cars to insist on having angle parking, which is dangerous on Main Street. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Um, I, I see one hand, um, Selena, I apologize um, if that's not how you pronounce your name. Um, and, and I just want to finish comment on Main Street um, is, you, is your comment about, um, uh, about the Main Street agenda item. Um, we will unmute you here. Okay, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. A new work. Um, I messaged Cynthia. I was having trouble logging into Zoom, um, into the Zoom link, but it's about Main Street and Leeds, so it's not on oh. this item. Okay. Yeah. Let's. Um, I just want to finish up this agenda item, and and then we'll uh, we'll uh, recognize you. Okay. Um, is there anybody else who um, wishes to comment on on Main Street in downtown? Okay. Seeing and hearing none, um, Ben, again, thank you for your presentation. We appreciate that. Um, it, we will make sure that uh, in our conversations with Tool that um, this information is shared with them. Um, and um, uh, Wayne uh, and or uh, I will be in touch with you. So thank you again for uh, a really well done presentation. We appreciate your, your time and your efforts. Yeah, thanks a lot. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, given that um, there were some problems with the Zoom link, um, two folks had uh, difficulty uh, logging in and missed the opportunity for public comment. So I'm, I'm gonna just uh, give them the opportunity to speak right now and uh, recognize both of them. And one of them is um, Selena. So if you could just say your, your name and city or town of residence and um, you can speak to us, um, go ahead. There we go. Uh, so my name is Selena Della Croce. I live in Leeds. Um, I wasn't aware of the earlier meeting on this, so I missed the vote on timing before the recent ordinance was passed. But just as a reminder, there was an ordinance passed that banned parking on one side of the street, and that's what I'd like to speak to. Um, so I'm a renter. Our property, I live at 185 Main Street, second floor, and we don't have any off-street parking. It's a rental. Um, and so we rely on street parking in order to have somewhere to go and I rely on my car to get to work and, and the doctors and different things. Um, and so the initial concern that I had that I voiced in the letter to city council before the ordinance passed was that were a number of them, but I, and I hope that those were heard, but I'm gonna focus instead on some of the issues that have come up in addition to initial issues that I foresaw, which the most obvious of them is that there's nowhere to park for me when they're swimming. And so I can't like count on having like somewhere to come home to. There's no, the parking is banned on this side of the street. It's banned like down the block, it's banned on the other street. So there's actually, it's not like I can just like, I'm being lazy and I can just park down the street and come home. There's like nowhere for me to leave my car and nowhere for me to come home or unload groceries or anything like that. So because I rent, I can't make an investment in the property. The landlord doesn't wanna put in a parking lot. I really do rely on street parking. Um, and that's been a big issue. Another issue is that the side of the street that is allowed for parking floods. 
Um, I'm not sure, maybe at the end, I don't know if I have sharing capabilities, um, but I do have a picture. Um, I do not. Uh, but it floods on the other side of the street. And so what happens is all of our cars, and it's not just my apartment, it's my apartment, 185 downstairs, then the 183 doesn't have sufficient parking. So you'll always see like five or six or seven cars parked across from this unit um, for those of us who rent and rely on street parking. And so we like our cars, I mean, I'm worried about damage to my car because it's, I mean, it's been raining basically nonstop for three weeks. I'm basically forced to park on top of water when in, in giant puddles, when there's dry street parking on the other side, but I can't park there anymore because it's prohibited. And my, I have family here. My mom is 70 years old and has health issues. And so when she, initially I was concerned about her, if she comes to visit, like she's not gonna have anywhere to park. Um, so how did, I can't actually have my mom come and visit me because I don't have a driveway. Um, and in addition to that, she did come and park across the street because it was raining, there was parking because swimmers generally, there are people aren't going swimming in the rain. So there are more spots, but my mom like stepped into this huge puddle. Um, it's a bit weird, like try, it's just like, a, it's a big disability issue for people who aren't as able-bodied to be able to access the rental units here. And so I'm able-bodied, but that means that people I love aren't able-bodied, they can't come over. Um, and so that's been a big issue. Um, and one of the proposals I've been talking to Rachel Mayori, who's the one who let me know about this meeting, so our councilwoman, um, that I think she had a conflict this week, um, she's out of town, but um, one of the proposals that I had suggested is to allow, like if, I think the ideal would be to reverse it to how it was before, and I have thoughts on safety in the neighborhood um, and, and addressing the concerns where that came from, but, um, at the very least, or at least as a temporary solution, we're figuring out how I can come home at the end of the day, how my elderly mother can come and visit me, um, is to have like, to allow us to have guaranteed units to per, at least two per apartment on the side of the street, which doesn't really address if we wanna have people come visit us, but at least if I'm going to the store, I need to go to the doctors, I need to go to work, I can come home somewhere. Um, so that a proposal would be to have permit parking on our side of the street, which is not the riverside, um, in order to allow us to do that, to do that. And I think, um, something that I've been like my name, a lot of people in the neighborhood have been talking about this. Not everyone was able to come to the meeting, but the downstairs neighbors, the next door neighbors, the across the street neighbors have all been having a lot of issues since the parking ban was enforced. And it just seems really clear. I know oftentimes like ordinances will be put into effect with good intentions, thinking about safety. Um, but it's pretty clear that the people that, that like these, the like kind of day-to-day -day nitty gritty of actually living here wasn't really like factored into the planning. Um, and that may just be because people don't live on the street and you don't know, and they're all these, you know, how are you gonna know if you're not constantly in a certain place that it actually floods. Um, and the place, in addition to flooding, it's actually parked under all of the trees. So with all the storms, there's a huge, there's like a massive branch down in our backyard. Our, I mean, my car's either going to get crushed or it's going to get flooded and I'm going to have to be the one that pays for that. So in addition to not having anywhere to park, then I'm not going to have a car because I can't afford to get a new car if it gets flooded or crushed by a tree, um, which both of which are actually very likely. Um, and I am not able to show a picture on the Zoom feature, but um, yeah. No, so I, I'll, um, I'll jump in here. Thank you for your comments. Um, and the nature of public comment on a non-agenda item is that we can't engage with you. Um, but what I will say is please send us an email at dpwinfo at northamptonna.gov um, and we will, um, we will speak to you. Um, and uh, Cindy can put that right in the chat for you so you, you don't have to write quickly. So thank you very much for your comments. Thank you. Um, I see one more hand, and um, that is Emmeline. Hi. Uh, yes, I'm Emmeline Mesmer. I live in Leeds, particularly on the lower unit of 185, and I'm here to echo and also speak to my own experience of the same parking uh, issue that Selena just spoke to. Uh, I have a prepared statement because I'm not great at public speaking yet, so I hope you'll uh, not mind my delivery. Um, so I know the matter of parking in Leeds has already been settled by our council folk in the best way they could find. As a resident of 185 Main Street, I would like to put forth my observations for the last several weeks of the parking ban. 
in the time that has passed, without cars on both sides of our street, drivers have been gradually increasing the speeds they feel comfortable traveling on our road. And the only place I get this from is my own observation. I don't have like a, a monitor or anything. Um, but our unit has no off-street parking available to it. And this increase in speed has made it less safe for us to cross and access our cars, which are only you know, legally allowed on the other side of the street. Uh, once we make it to the other side, you can find our cars standing in a growing puddle of mud and standing water. Uh, there is no drainage for this little corner. Uh, now easily two inches deep and crept several feet out from its original dirt bank. Uh, and that mud is really, really slippery. Uh, I've almost fallen myself a few times trying to jump over it and the momentum, it's, it's a nightmare. Uh, with the windstorms passing through, a branch narrowly missed my upstairs, upstairs neighbor's car, and I do fear for the safety of my vehicle beneath the trees as these storms continue. I ask the council to consider an amendment to the parking ban to allow for permitted parking for residents on the east side of the street. Not only will this measure give us relief from the eroding riverbed and storm damage, uh, Director Lascalia has also suggested uh, previously that having some cars on both sides of the road is a factor in managing speeds of passing motorists and could better serve the goal of preserving safety on our road. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, and, and again, if you wouldn't mind, um, we put our email address in, in the chat and I, I would, um, we would appreciate having your contact information so we can follow up with you. Thank you. Okay, next we'll, um, we'll move to uh, item 5B, which is a uh, discussion of a traffic calming request that we received uh, for North Street. Um, and um, I will uh, uh, just give a little bit of background on this. And um, this is part of our new traffic calming process. Um, so we've moved several applications um, through this commission um, using a, a structure whereby we receive a traffic coming re request and uh, DPW and police review data on the street. And then we invite discussion um, at TPC uh, ab about it once we have some data to deliver. Um, so uh, we received um, a traffic coming request stating the, stating the following. Um, there are some residential streets where a center stripe can actually encourage motorist speeds and discourage a shared street mentality by sending the message to the motorist that the lane is their space. There are speed tables on North Street, but drivers still go really fast in between. I would suggest removing the yellow stripe to reinforce the impression that this is not a highway. It ought to be a shared yield street. Overall traffic on this street is fairly low, and the curb to curb width is narrow with no room for a separate bike lane. Um, so prior to uh, um, getting into the data, um, I, I am wondering if there is anyone here to um, speak, uh, Councillor Nash, if, if you are um, able to speak to this, um, or I'd just like to know if there are any residents from the neighborhood who, who are here um, who may want to speak to us about this. Councillor, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Director. I, I really, um, I, I, I haven't been contacted directly by this constituent, and um, and that I, I am interested in hearing, you know, uh, uh, the your your the official responses to you know center lines and and how they might be speeding people up. Um, I, I'm. I've, I've always been under the impression that they actually help slow people down uh, by narrowing the travel lane. And um, so um, anyway, thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Councillor. Um, so I will share um, the, DPW, the DPW's assessment of the roadway. Um, in the absence of the chief of police, I, I will also speak to the data that her department analyzed and collected, and then I will open it up for discussion with other commissioners. Um, so the street description is, is that it, it connects King Street and Bates Street. It's 3,260 feet long and 28 feet wide. There are concrete sidewalks on both sides of the street. And as noted, there are painted double yellow center lines and white edge lines that delineate 11 foot travel lanes. 
There are three raised crosswalks present at the intersections of Parsons Street, Orchard Street, and Lincoln Avenue. There are also several existing no parking regulations. Um, there is an existing speed regulation for North Street uh, from 1986. Uh, that's when it went into effect. The speed limit beginning at Head Street, uh, I'm sorry, beginning at King Street and, and headed towards Day Avenue is 30 miles an hour. Um, the pavement uh, we consider to be in good condition. Um, so that is the DPW's uh, assessment of, of um, this roadway. Um, it, moving on to the data that was collected by the chief of police and that I am sharing on her behalf, um, they analyzed both speed data um, and crash data. Um, and they collected covert speed data um, back in September for one week. During the collection period, 13,067 vehicles were analyzed. The average speed was 27 miles an hour and only 3% of the vehicles were determined to be enforceable violations. Um, so that, that means that the enforcement rating was ranked as low. The 85th percentile speed was 31 miles an hour. So not a significant speeding problem here. Um, she did pull the crash data and um, she pulled that from November 20th, 2015 through November 20th, 2020. A total of 12 collisions occurred, one in 2015, four in 2016, two in 2017, one in 2018, three in 2019, and one in 2020. One collision involved personal injury. Upon reviewing the collision data, it was determined that three collisions involved a, trike, a, a truck striking the railroad bridge. Three collisions were actually on King Street at the intersection with North Street. Three collisions were at North Street at Market Street and involved a minor rear end at the stop sign, an OUI crash, and a driver who failed to fully stop at the stop sign and pulled in front of a car on Market Street. These nine collisions did not occur in the area that was identified by the resident in their traffic calming request. The remaining three collisions involved the driver who lost control of their vehicle and struck a pole near 84 North Street. This was caused by driver error and poor vehicle equipment, uh, namely bald tires. Um, there was a three-car collision at the intersection with Elizabeth Street. A vehicle had stopped to turn, and a second vehicle stopped behind that one. The third vehicle struck the stopped vehicle. Speed and inadequate following distance likely contributed to this collision. And then the, the final one was a pizza delivery driver who stopped in the middle of the travel lane and attempted to drive in reverse after driving by the address of the delivery. That vehicle was rear-ended. Um, so those are the police department's um, uh, review of, again, collision and speed data. Um, generally, counselor, to answer your question, um, we do view uh, line striping as a traffic calming measure and, and actually do implement line striping as part of an effort to um, sort of visually narrow the roadway and, and show drivers, um, you know, where, where they're supposed to be. Um, you know, sometimes folks can sort of wander onto the wrong side of the road um, or uh, uh, make poor choices with turning radiuses and so on. Um, so, um, you know, our, our, our assessment is based on that data that I just presented, and I will open it up to the commission if anyone has any uh, comments or questions on that. Councillor. Yeah, I, I just want to add that this, uh, this roadway was rebuilt, I'm guessing, 12 years ago, and a lot of the uh, traffic calming features that are mentioned here, you know, there's the line striping, but also the, the, the raised crosswalks. Uh, I believe the street was narrowed as well, and there's lots of new pedestrian amenities that have, uh, that have been built in, you know, that were included in that rebuild, um, and that the street has kind of been a model street as to, like, I think everybody would like their street to be re rebuilt like North Street, and um, and I think um, and I think the the data here reflects that um, that that rebuild and and the current design um, as far as the you know 27 miles per hour being the average speed limit shows that this is that it's pretty effective, and so um, so yeah so I I. I, I Let's build more roads like this, Director. <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Any other commissioners have any questions or comments um, about North Street um, based on what we've discussed? Okay, seeing and hearing none, um, the, the next part of um, this process or, or this part of this process is um, we want to make certain that, you know, we, we have um, collected data and what we want to make sure of is that we are not missing anything. We want to make sure that we give um, if the counselor of, in the affected area the opportunity to speak um, and, and any residents um, who may have been part of the traffic calming application or who may, who may be um, otherwise impacted um, by what's going on on the street ha have an opportunity to speak to us. Um, but the chief of police and I will um, review all of this information and we will issue a written recommendation that, that we will then um, submit to this commission uh, at a later meeting, um, if, hearing no further comments on this. Okay, we will close the discussion then. Um, next is a discussion of a traffic calming request on High Street. Um, so this traffic calming request was submitted to us with the following statement. Motorists speed through this section of High Street, apparently using it as a cut through to avoid the traffic light intersection at Chestnut and Route 9. People consistently exceed the speed limit and young children live in this neighborhood. It is dangerous. Um, so we uh, assess the street and have the following um, uh, information to report. Um, street connects North Maple Street and Straw Avenue. Um, the, the, uh, this particular request is, is concerned about the section between Chestnut Street and Strayer Avenue. The street here is approximately 2,400 feet long and 26 feet wide. There are concrete sidewalks on the south side between North Maple Street and Chestnut Street and asphalt sidewalks on the north side from Chestnut Street to Strayer Avenue. There is one marked crosswalk across High Street near Keys Street. Parking is prohibited on the north side. Um, from North Maple Street, to, uh, um, I, I'm sorry, from a point 234 feet easterly from North Maple Street to a point 410 feet easterly from North Maple Street and on the south side from North Maple Street um, uh, to um, a, a point about 56 feet away. There is no record of a speed regulation for this street, um, but it is thickly settled. So what this means is that a statutory speed limit of 30 miles an hour is in effect. Um, the pavement is in deficient condition. Um, so the police, again, um, analyzed crash data and speed data. Covert speed data collection was conducted between March 5th and March 12th of this year. The device was placed midway between Chestnut Street and Stra Avenue. In total, 3,071 vehicles were analyzed. The average speed was 23 miles an hour, and the 85th percentile speed was 29.1 miles an hour. Um, so I, again, not uh, any sort of noticeable um, uh, speeding problem here. Um, the police department also reviewed a five-year collision analysis from February 20th of 2016 to February 20th of 2021. There were 13 collisions identified in this five-year period. Two notable patterns emerged. The first involved the intersection of Chestnut and High Street. Five of the 13 collisions occurred at this intersection. Four of those involved drivers who either failed to stop at the sign, at the, stop at the stop sign at all, or who stopped and then pulled out in front of a car traveling on Chestnut Street. The second pattern detected was that six of the collisions involved vehicles striking parked vehicles that were parked at or near 110 High Street just after the intersection with Keys Street. None of the 13 collisions resulted in personal injury and speed was not identified as a significant factor in these collisions. Um, I'm wondering if there is anyone here from that neighborhood um, who has anything um, further to share with us on this. I think I see uh, I think I see two hands. Um, Jeremy, I see your hand first. Um, so, Hi. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I, my name is Jeremy Gans. I live at 24 High Street, um, and I've been here for about five years. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old child. And in full disclosure, I was the person who uh, submitted the calming request. And uh, I really appreciate the 
the data that the city has collected. Um, obviously, I didn't collect data myself, and I'm going more on anecdotal observations. Um, I've certainly seen <clears throat> with relative frequency people, I would guess going over 30 miles an hour. Um, I would just say as a side note, I, I would like, I would hope that maybe the speed limit could be posted. I don't believe it's posted anywhere on the street um, and ideally perhaps could be lower than 30 miles an hour. Um, I live on the side of the street without a sidewalk um, and there's often parked cars on our side, which creates some difficulties occasionally just getting a sight line on the road as I'm trying to cross with my young children. Um, and people do sometimes really come kind of zooming around the corner from Straw Avenue down High Street toward Chestnut um, and sometimes vice versa. Um, it is, a, I think, a relatively wide street. So when there are not cars parked on the road, people, uh, I think, can feel comfortable raising their speed over 30. But um, again, that's just my my observations over the years living here. I don't have any data. Um, I would, I would, uh, I guess I'll just stop there. Um, I do think, and I'm not sure what's normal or typical around the city, but just having a speed limit posted um, could be helpful. Um, so I'll stop there. And, and again, thank you for the opportunity to speak today. Thank you for your comments, um, which I will address. I just want to um, give, I see Kathleen with a hand up here. So um, we, we will um, let everyone speak and, and then I can respond. Okay, thank you so much. Um, my name is Kathy Robleski. I actually live at 29 High Street near Jeremy. And, um, you know, this is something that I've been kind of uh, concerned about for quite a while, but I just never wanted to bring it up because I didn't want to, you know, uh, kind of rock the boat. But um, I will say that um, I live on the corner of Garfield and High, and I have been noticing, especially during COVID time, uh, the rate of speed of people has increased dramatically. And yes, I would say that it's not every car, but it's significant enough, I think, that um, it could be dangerous or it could be um, in some ways harmful to people that are on the street. And I'm saying this because because you mentioned the sidewalks. I'm an avid walker, but the sidewalks are in such terrible condition on High Street that you have to walk on the streets. And I have been walking on the streets and seeing people go 60, 70 miles an hour on that street, which is just, you know, it's not built for that. And, you know, there's part of it is the thrill of it because people go up the incline and then they go down or they go down it and they gather speed. The other thing that happens, and I know this because again, I live on the corner, people go so fast going from High Street and then turning into Garfield that very often I can see them, especially when I'm working outside in my garden, just barely miss a car if they're coming from Garfield and turning into high street. I don't know if that makes any sense to you whatsoever, um, but they're going so fast. I've seen them actually swerve up and go up onto the Travers lawn just to avoid them. Um, so I do, you know, it's been something that's been of a concern for me for a while. And the other reason I'm also concerned is because when I get out of my driveway, I'm going down a slight hill and it's blinded. And I don't know how many times I've gone down and I have a car that has the camera in the back. And it gives me the alert when a, when a car is coming, but it's amazing how fast they go around. And I think I'm in the clear and I'm not. And so I know just from anecdotally in my experience that you know it's it's been increasingly getting bad. And I do know that you've just said that they did the analysis from March 5th to the 12th. Um, you know, I don't know what the weather conditions were then. Um, I would probably recommend probably doing something in the summer and maybe for a little longer time. I think that you would be surprised to find out how many people actually go very fast. And um, so it's just a concern of mine. I've, um, I think I did bring up to a previous counselor, you know, just kind of um, not officially that I thought, wouldn't it be nice to have one of those little units that tell people their speed? I don't know if they work. I don't know if it's a, it will change their behavior, but I do agree with Jeremy. I don't think anybody knows how fast they they should be going. And, um, and I, I think it's also a problem on Garfield because it's a dead end and nobody ever patrols it. So they just go very fast down Garfield and they just swing onto High Street without even stopping. 
So that's my concern. I, I, I hope they do another data analysis. And I will just say something that um, my niece works for an insurance company. And she said in the last year that um, most of the accidents that have been reported within their company have become are be, as a result of high speed because there were less vehicles on the road, people were taking more chances by going faster. So I would like to see another um, data analysis done. And that's just, you know, um, you know, this is the first time I've ever talked in one of these sessions. It's, you know, it, I mean, it's, I know from just working in my yard and, and just being in the neighborhood and doing a lot of walking, the speeders are there. It's, you know, it's not so much that, you know, yes, maybe 80 something are going the right speed limit, but it's, it's those other people and it's pretty scary when they go fast. So thank you so much for um, letting me speak. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, and, and before I uh, open it up to the other commissioners, um, I, I just want to um, uh, talk a little bit about speed limits. Um, we, we do talk about speed limits uh, quite a bit at, at this commission, obviously. Um, there are two different types of speed limits within the city. One is a regulatory speed limit and one is a statutory speed limit. A regulatory speed limit is when you see a black and white speed limit sign. Those are the standard signs that you see like on the interstate or on many city roads. Um, the majority of our city roads actually. And that means that there has been a formal um, engineering analysis and study um, of turning movements, uh, car counts, speed data, uh, roadway assessment um, that, that has actually been done by a professional engineering firm submitted to MassDOT, approved by MassDOT, and then a speed regulation goes into effect. Um, so I, I talked about that a little bit for North Street. There is a formal speed regulation on North Street. Um, there is not a formal speed regulation on this street. Um, so there is what is called a statutory speed limit. Um, and a statutory speed limit is, is uh, um, defined under mass general law as speeds that are reasonable and proper um, given the characteristic of the neighborhood. The characteristic of this neighborhood is that it is thickly settled. Um, because it is thickly settled, the reasonable and proper speed is 30 miles an hour. And, and that is um, by mass general law. Um, so we do not um, have the ability to post statutory speed limits. We, we can't put up a black and white speed limit sign that is um, communicating to people, okay, you know, this is what you need to do and this is the speed you need to travel um, because this is actually a statutory um, speed limit and not a regulatory one. So that is um, kind of a distinction that I always try to make um, in, in situations like this to just explain why you don't see a speed limit sign on, on this road. And, and that's standard in, in many locations around the city. Um, and again, in order to get a regulatory speed limit, um, a, a study needs to be commissioned um, and, and then submitted to MassDOT. And we don't actually get to pick the results of the study. Um, the, the, it just, you know, the engineering data sort of bears out what the speed limit is. Um, and and we, don't, we don't get to say, oh, well, that doesn't work for us. You know, it needs to be something different. Um, so that, that's just an explanation about speed limits. Um, so I'll open this up to others on the um, commission if, if they have any questions or comments about um, this or, or the data that, that we've presented. Councillor Nash, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Director. So I did get, a, so uh, Councillor Jarrett, who is the Councillor for Ward 5, where this uh, street is located, sent me an email uh, asking that I sp speak on his behalf so he can be relaxing and not in a, in a Zoom meeting. And that, um, and so it, what he'd like me to relay, and, and I share some of his, I share his views on this, that, um, that the, the, the speed limit on this street is 30 miles an hour. And, um, and that uh, we, uh, we both agree that it, it would be great if there were a way to reduce that speed limit uh, further. And, and director, as you've just explained, where there is the regulatory speed limits, that's, that's pretty problematic because we have to go back through uh, doing uh, traffic studies and, uh, and it can be expensive and we may not get the outcomes we want. But this being a situation where there's a statutory speed limit, it, it may be one of those situations where, you know, where we consider uh, accepting that 25 mile an hour speed limit 
and and we can uh, possibly we can lower the speed limit, but then to the residents, we have no way of posting that speed limit. <laughs> It's 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 the tree falling in the forest. Does anybody hear it? Type of situation. So um, anyway, um, so Councillor Jarrett just wanted me to to say that he fully expected that the the traffic uh, calming study uh, results would be that everybody's pretty much adhering to uh, the, the the travel speed, but also that. He, he thinks that we we as a city should be thinking about ways to lower our speed limits and and I'm on board with them with that. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Councillor. Um, Diana, did I see your hand raised? Yeah, yeah. go ahead. Thanks, Donna. I apologize if I missed this the first time around, but I was curious about through the March 5th study uh, registered a, a peak speed or what was the top speed that was that was caught on that roadway? Um, I do not have the top speed data. Um, I have a report that was written by the chief, so I'm, I'm sort of communicating her data, but I, I'm sorry that DPW is not the one that collects the data, so I, I'm not able to answer that detailed question, but um, we could certainly um, you know, continue this conversation at, 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 at another uh, TPC meeting um, and, and get into more detail on that. Thank you. Any other members of the commission have any comments? Councillor Foster, go ahead. Yeah, I, um, I'm, I'm trying to picture it, but uh, Donna, when you mentioned that six of the accidents involved um, parked cars and one section of High Street there, uh, and I'm sorry, I'm not able to picture it in my mind, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or recommendations about that one stretch where cars are parked, if there's anything we could do differently with the road right there. Well, I, I, and I, I think that, you know, part of the reason that, that we want to talk about this at the commission and that I also want to hear from residents is, I, I mean, we've obviously got a little bit of a cluster here, you know, that, that we're not aware of until we actually review the data, which is why, you know, we want to review the data. Um, I, I can't speak to the phenomenon that's happening here, but, um, I, what I would say our next steps would be is is further analysis of this particular stretch of roadway to determine, you know, th there's obviously a narrowing effect going on here, or you know, there there's some phenomenon that's happening that that is creating a, a crash cluster, um, and and that's what we need to try to parse out here. Um, so I I just wanted to you know hear what what everyone had to say, um, and, and then we have to go back and look at this a little bit more closely. Um, so that's the sort of the value of, of this process um, is, is really just listening um, so that we can make more informed decisions. So I don't have an answer to your question right now, but um, obviously there's some further review that we need to do here. And I think um, we lost Councillor Foster briefly, um, but I, I, I'm not sure if you can hear us, but, um, but hopefully that answers your question. It does, thank you. Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great, thank you. Okay, any other um, comments from uh, the commissioners on this? Um, so what I would say to the, the residents who are here is that there will be follow-up from us uh, on this. Um, you know, we, we often, um, uh, see matters that are uh, black and white, and we often see matters that that are not. Um, and it is clear to me that that we need to look at this area a little bit more closely. So um, that is uh, DPW and police's commitment to this neighborhood. Um, and Councillor Nash, if you could communicate that back to Councillor Jarrett, and um, we'll be reviewing our options, and um, we we will discuss this at a at a future meeting. So um, we will be in touch. Um, with the neighborhood um, and with Councillor Jarrett and with this commission. Any further discussion on this prior to me moving on? Okay, all right, seeing none, um, 5D is a proposed ordinance to create Armory Street parking lot loading zone. Um, I will 
um, read the proposed ordinance uh, in the year 2021 upon the recommendation of the Transportation and Parking Commission, an ordinance relative to off-street service areas, an ordinance of the City of Northampton, Massachusetts, be it ordained by the City Council of the City of Northampton and City Council assembled as follows. Section 1, that Section 312-118 of the Code of Ordinances be amended as follows. Section 312-118, Schedule... Um, testing my Roman numerals here are 17 on street and off street service areas B off street service areas are established as follows parking area Armory Street parking lot location the back entrance of 150 Main Street west of the Armory Street parking lot type parking loading and unloading zone only may I have a motion for a positive recommendation please. I'll make a motion for a positive recommendation. I'll second it. Okay, thank you. Um, it, Nancy, would you like to um, speak to this proposed Certainly. ordinance for us? Thanks. This uh, proposed ordinance is in response to the difficulty that the merchants are um, experiencing having deliveries um, to the various stores that are located in Thorns. The closest uh, delivery area is um, actually a considerable distance from the back door and the back door is the most appropriate um, delivery area. It also has access to an elevator. Um, it doesn't congest parking up on Main Street like deliveries would to the front entrance. However, there is no, there isn't a service delivery area located here. So there's the conflict of um, vehicles parking there to make deliveries and the ordinance actually prohibiting the parking of vehicles in this location. So um, this is a kind of a common sense approach to this, this um, difficulty in that we need to establish a service area here so that the merchants can be supported with deliveries to their businesses. Um, it would appear to me, the reason why I proposed one space is that that is, um, adequate for this. However, I know that um, Jody Doyle from Thorns is also here and um, would like to speak on the matter too. Sure. So hello everybody, I'm Jody Dole. I'm the co-owner and manager of Thorns Marketplace. I wanted to thank Nancy for pursuing this ordinance because uh, since the 70s when Thorns opened, there, the, there's been kind of an unwritten uh, understanding of how that space was to be used and sometimes it's abused and sometimes it's not. Um, my, my concern with the, what Nancy shared is the single spot idea. This pad in the back is 37 by 53. We have 30 shops and restaurants here at Thorns. We are open seven days a week. We receive um, deliveries six days of the week from morning until night. We frequently have multiple deliveries going on simultaneously, including tenants unloading and loading goods as they do. Um, and as Nancy mentioned, this is the only place where we can make deliveries to Thorns. Um, so we just want to continue to utilize that whole pad so we can have multiple deliveries going on simultaneously. If we had to limit it to one area of that pad, we would have semis and other delivery trucks backing up into Kirkland Ave's parking lot. And we would lose those people because many of the delivery folks are on a fixed schedule and they don't wait around. Like they're there to drop the goods. And if we don't see them that day, they're gone for multiple days. It's perishables, it could be seafood. So I'm concerned about having one spot. Um, and also I don't think we have the ability here at Thorns to build a, a calendar of deliveries because we you have no idea when these people are going to show up especially with the supply chain issues we're facing so i would love to designate this officially as a thorns loading area but i would love it you know we really need the whole area um, and so i was hoping the committee would consider that as part of the proposal thanks Hi. thanks for listening thank you um, Nancy, can you describe to us how you would foresee this being marked or, or signed or what, what would this look like exactly? The, the um, problem that 
is occurring at this location is that it sometimes turns into multiple vehicles from um, repair people, deliveries. Um, we need to have an actual marked area where the truck parks and that it limits the number of vehicles that are piling up at this back entrance because we also need to understand that this is a back entrance. This is a, a main entrance through the back of, of Thorns. Um, so we need to accommodate safely uh, the pedestrian traffic that, that's there also. Um, so I'm not averse to an additional space if, and I think that Maggie would be a good person to, to chime in here. Can we do that safely? Do we have enough room to do that safely? And also to be able to accommodate the um, pedestrians. Yeah, and, and I guess my question is what, what level of enforcement, if any, is happening oh, here and now? There is, there's enforcement happening because um, right now it is, it, it's a sidewalk these vehicles are parking on a sidewalk. So we need to make this change because we are enforcing that area as a sidewalk and vehicles are being ticketed and have been ticketed fairly regularly. Um, so there's the conflict of, we need to actually make it one or the other. It's, it's, it's like nothing now. It, is it a sidewalk? Do we, do we accommodate the pedestrians only or do we actually assist the, the merchants in Thorns Market and, and make a designated loading and unloading zone? But it needs to be loading and unloading only and not for um, tradespeople to sit there all day taking up that space. Okay, Jody, I see that you um, wish to speak. Please go ahead. Um, I, you know, Nancy is absolutely right when she talks about the conflict between contractors and delivery people. And we, Thorns owns that issue. And I spoke to Nancy today and said, we can clean the contractors out of that space. I have no problem taking care of that for us. But we still need, we need those three spots because you sometimes, if this picture doesn't show it, you can get back three trucks into there um, to, to take deliveries. There is a nine foot sidewalk behind those concrete, those steel barriers underneath that awning. And this curb in the front with the, um, the pavers, that's eight feet wide. So you have, the move, you have pedestrian availability on the front and the back. The question is, do they need it along a regulated side? You know, Or can they go around the bushes where the sidewalk goes and then walk under the awning, which a lot do as well. So, Thanks again. <laughs> okay, thank you. Councillor Nash, go ahead. So to be clear, I, th you know, initially when I looked at the ordinance and the proposed ordinance and I drove through the area today, I thought we were essentially extending the loading zone because the, on the street here, this is all no parking. And so I pictured that's what we were doing. But if you could go back to showing that UPS truck is that what we're talking about allowing people to back into there? Is that what this ordinance would allow? Right, this would, the, what the proposed ordinance is, is to put um, a delivery spot just in front. My, I was envisioning that it would be just in front of where this UPS vehicle is. Yeah. So that if you were to pull that UPS vehicle forward, you would have a designated space there to make deliveries. And for one vehicle. For one vehicle. But that's not what Jody was saying. I thought she said the whole area. Well, she, right. She is requesting that this whole area be made a delivery zone. Go ahead, counselor. And, and this, this whole area, like where the UPS truck is, that is city property? Yes. Okay. 
and we will buy it from the city if they're willing to sell it to us. <laughs> I'm not kidding. I'm not kidding. <laughs> I don't think we have the authority to do that in this meeting. <laughs> not at this meeting, but maybe another one. Hey, Adam, did you have a comment? Uh, yeah. So what what the the sort of counter proposal is that everything from this from the building, the brick building across essentially to the hedge really um, would become uh, a loading zone and effectively where the pavement is raised to the level of the sidewalk that effectively becomes a curb cut to uh, back the vehicles into that area. Is that am I understanding that properly? Yeah, and that curb cut already exists. That already is there. Um, right. And that shed is a city shed that is for, it's a shared recycling shed. So that would stay there. Okay. That's the shared recycling. <laughs> yeah, there it is. <laughs> and I, I really do feel that this is necessary because if we could move over to where the, um, the actual loading zone is, mm -hmm. further down, right. Keep going. See about where that bicycle is? That's that's the only service loading and unloading space that there is, and they would have to park there. I mean, it's almost like, uh, sorry, I'm jumping in front of you, Jim. Go ahead. I bet effectively it's already being used this way, right? Yes. These delivery yes. drivers risk a ticket but I mean, we all know how they operate, just like that UPS truck that's there. They're backing in there and they're happy to take the chance. Yeah, for 50 years, and it's just recently, Nancy's fat folks have been ticketing appropriately to try to move the issue right. forward. I mean, my only concern would be pedestrians. And as Jody points out, and I use that entrance all the time, it's very easy to go around the other way. So, you know, if we mark it as a loading area, then, you know, maybe there's some marking so that pedestrians understand to use, you know, that sidewalk to the left of the hedge. Yeah. I mean, I, I don't see any other issue here. I mean, obviously these are important businesses there. I assume the loading zone would also help Michelson and the other businesses. I mean, why wouldn't we support a change like this? Yeah. The and and I just want to clarify where I, I just want to clarify exactly what we're talking about here. So I'm I'm hearing one spot, but we're actually looking at this entire area. The the way this ordinance is is written, it's not um, particular. You know, you know, it does not specify. Um, you know, dimensionally what, what we're looking at for space here. So I just want to be clear exactly what we're talking about. And, and if we do need to amend this ordinance mm -hmm. um, to actually specify dimensionally what we are allowing, um, you know, we can sign this, um, meaning, you know, put up a sign that says loading zone. But I I want to make sure we're clear, you know, are we talking about one spot dimensionally, you know, how big of an area are we talking about and is, is further review necessary here? Also, do we need to um, have this reviewed also with the fire department? It, it, will that limit any type of access? Um, I'm, I'm not quite sure because I'm envisioning one space. If we're talking about taking over that whole area as a delivery zone with multiple trucks parked in there, do we now need to look at this further and get input um, from, from the fire department and, and look at it, like you're saying, measured out dimensionally? And it, I, I would not be comfortable um, moving this forward without engaging the fire chief um, okay. and, and having um, the really clarified dimensions so that we're, we're clear. Um, and, and the other thing that, that Jody did mention um, is um, a actual ownership of the sidewalk. Um, and, and that's actually a conversation that we can have. 
um, that that may actually make things easier. Um, so I, I think this might be a a larger conversation um, that, than we're able to solve here today. That that requires a little bit further assessment um, and, and engagement um, with you know police and fire um, and, um, and and a larger conversation. And I I definitely support creating a, a loading and unloading zone. But as you're saying, we just need to make sure that we're doing it so that it's a safe and proper way. Yeah, Councilor Nash, go ahead. Yeah, I just, I, I wanna add that this is, what we're talking about is something that Ben had mentioned earlier, the, the issue of loading zones and also the, you know, longer term of contractors coming into buildings, you know, and this is, a, this area of downtown is a much more, it's a better place to have that kind of parking going on. But I, I think we, I, I can tell you right now that, as written, if it went went to council, uh, you know that it probably would not pass. There would be way too many questions, and so I, I recommend you know doing just what um, you know uh, Donna was just saying that you know we we table this, uh, have some more work done on this, and uh, but I think it does match up with the idea of what Main Street Design was just talking about. You know, Main Street for everyone that um, that this is. It, better utilizing this for, you know, deliveries and, and for con contractors would make a lot more sense. And the last thing is that the, the tricky part, and this is, this is for Jody to hear, is that, uh, that if it's public property, designating it for a particular property owner is going to create, uh, the, that's, that's an issue when it comes to uh, regulating any of uh, the the public way and it was actually it's it's part of the issue of what we're talking of you know it was just mentioned to us about um uh, about a half hour ago about main street and leeds that we need to come up with ways that are equitable and apply to everybody equally although it may not impact everybody equally um so anyway that's my thoughts more study and, but I, I think it's, it, it's, it's worth having this conversation. Okay, Diana, go ahead. Um, just when we're looking at more studies, since it, it seems like the business has a need for that entire area, all three spaces, that maybe we could ask them if putting stripes in there so it looks like stalls so that delivery trucks aren't parking willy-nilly, if that might be more efficient. Um, it seems like that might be a thing to maybe bring up sooner if, if that would make a difference as far as safety in that area. Yes, thank you. And, and yeah, and that's the, you know, sort of how are, how are we communicating, you know, to people what, where they're supposed to go and how, how they're supposed to park. Um, so I, I think that um, we have a, a, some level of agreement here uh, about um, what we need to do with this. Um, I just want to make sure there's not further comments on it. Um, anyone else have anything further? Um, Councillor, uh, either Councillor Nash or Foster, procedurally, we have this on the floor with a positive recommendation. How, uh, how do you recommend that we um, move to table this or what um, procedurally can you advise me on how to proceed? Yeah, I can withdraw my motion and um... And uh, and the second can be withdrawn. Was that Councillor Foster? I think that was me. Okay. And if we it, it and if I'll agree to withdraw, and if Adam agrees to withdraw, then uh, then it's off the the the, the floor for vote, and uh, then we can have a uh, somebody can make a motion to uh, re, you know have us do further study. Okay, so may I have a motion um, for further study on um, the ordinance relative to off-street parking areas uh, at the back entrance of 150 Main Street, please. Go for it, Adam. I'll make that motion. Thanks, Jim. Uh -oh. <laughs> <I'll second. laughs> okay. Any further discussion? Okay, hearing none, Beth, could you call the roll, please? 
I'm sorry, who seconded that? Was it Jim? Did you just reverse your roles? Yes, exactly. <laughs> Donna? Yes. Um, Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. Passes unanimously with eight votes. Okay, thank you, Beth. Okay, there'll be Nancy. We'll um, we'll follow up with this, and Jody, we will we will be in touch. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, next is new business reserved for matters not reasonably anticipated. Does anyone have any new business? Okay, hearing none. May I have a motion to adjourn, please? I'll make a motion to adjourn. Second. All right. Okay, Beth, you all set? Nancy seconded that? Um, okay. That was Jim and Nancy? Yes. Okay, any discussion? Okay, hearing none, please call the roll. Donna? Yes. Jamie? Yes. Wayne? Yes. Nancy? Yes. Karen? Yes. Jim? Yes. Adam? Yes. Diana? Yes. Okay, thank you all. We'll see you next month. Take care. Bye-bye.